to the Everett Church of the Brethren Church family. And I welcome you to hear the parables, to hear the, the, the similes, the kingdom of heaven is like, and to think about how we, as children of God, as people of this community, or close or far, how we exist in this kingdom and what difference this kingdom makes for us in the way we live and the choices we make and the way we relate with each other and the way we face difficulties and challenges and crises. So I welcome you, I welcome you to worship and I invite you to hear with me with prayer for you. For a call to worship, I invite you to hear with me, to share with me the words from Psalm 100. We could share this together in unison. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God. It is he that made us, and we are his. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name. For the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. The 
the song from kind of based on Isaiah 55. Um, again, is the invitation to come. Let all who thirst, let them come. So I invite you to, to sing with me, to hear this, this yearning and this invitation that God extends to all people. Oh God, we pray that you would help all of us, help all people to feel the drawing, the drawing satisfaction, the open arms and the welcome of the kingdom of heaven, of the father who welcomes his son home after being lost and away. Help us, O oh Lord, to hear your spirit drawing us home. We pray, O oh God, for those who are alone, for those who feel isolated, for those who feel anxious or vulnerable. We, we pray for those who might feel uh, anxious about financial challenges or about the illness that's, that's raging among us. Oh, we pray, O oh God, that wherever we may be, whatever our situation, you might draw us in to the loving arms, that you might help each of us to hear the whisper, you are special, you are called, you are mine. Oh Lord, invite us and draw us in during this time of worship, for we ask in the name of Jesus, the one who brought this message to us. As I shared, the reading this morning is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13. And as I shared, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13, is kind of a central, a central teaching of the third of five that kind of organized the Gospel in the, in, the, in the life of Jesus as Matthew tells the story, as Matthew shares according to his understanding and experience. This chapter is about the kingdom of heaven. It's parables, parables that that are intriguing, parables that are full of mystery and 
parables that invite us and challenge us to ponder, to prayerfully ponder, what, what, what does this mean? What do these mean? And how do they speak to me at this moment, in this time, in this setting, in this situation that we are all in, unique and yet in so many ways similar? Hear the words of the Gospel of Matthew. Verse 31 to 33. And then 44 to 50. 52, I'm sorry. And I'll be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. He put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in its field. It's the smallest of all the seeds, but when it has grown, it's the greatest of the shrubs and becomes a tree so that the birds can come from the air and make their nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed it with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. And from 44. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which someone found and hid. Then, in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that's thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. And when it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down and put the good into baskets and threw the bad away. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And to end them there. The kingdom of heaven is like. This week, uh, my, my, one part of my experience was coming upon uh, an email from the General Board, the Church of the Brother Ministry, Mission and Ministry Board, and in the email there were some links to resources for July and August, and most of those resources focus on the issue of race in America, a challenging, a challenging thing that's, that's kind of troubling America right now. Not that it hasn't troubled America for a long time, but it brought attention this week. As I looked in those resources, there's the story of Brian Stevenson. Brian Stevenson grew up in uh, Maryland, Eastern Shore, Maryland, not far from Amy. Um, I think he graduated from Henlopen, Cape Henlopen High School, only, I don't know, 30 miles or so from where Amy grew up. Went on to school, went to college, Harvard Law School, and as he graduated, instead of seeking a prestigious firm, instead of looking for wealth and fame, he went to Montgomery, Alabama, where he formed this initiative. It's called the Equal Justice Initiative. Brian Stevenson, in a TED Talk seven or eight years ago, told the story, told the story um, about who he is. And in the story, he's talking about his grandma, African-American grandma, and how when he would go to grandma, he, first of all, there were a lot of grandkids. His mom was a part of a big family, and and Brian and the other kids all felt that it was a little hard to get their grandma's attention. It, they all loved her so dearly. They all wanted to be in the focus. And Brian remembers his grandma, his grandma hugging him, hugging him to the point that he could hardly breathe. And later she would say, you know, do you remember, do you still feel that hug? And if he would say no, then she'd envelop him again. And uh, I would encourage you to look up this, this TED Talk. In fact, we'll share the link to this a little later. It's a wonderful story. He's a wonderful communicator. 
He remembers one day he was at his grandma's and he woke up and went downstairs and he sat there, he was playing around in a room with some other, some other of his cousins and his grandmother's staring at him, just staring for a while, you know, 10 or 15 minutes. And after this while of staring, she says, Brian, Brian, I want you to come with me. I want to go outside. I want you to come off with me. And if I, if I can, I want to share some of the story from, from his own words. Um, he goes out in the backyard with his grandma. And she says, you know, I'm going to tell you something. And I don't want you to tell anybody what I tell you. And Brian says, I, I said, okay, Mama. She said, now, you make sure that you don't do that. I said, sure. And she sat me down and she looked at me and she said, I want you to know I've been watching you. And she said, I think you're special. She said, I think you can do anything, anything you want to do. Brian writes, he, he tells in his, his talk, I, I will never forget that moment. And then she said, I want you to promise me three things, Brian. I said, okay, mama. First thing I want you to promise me is that you'll love your mom. She said, that's my baby girl, and you have to promise me now that you'll always take care of her. Well, I adored my mom, so I said, yes, mama, I'll do that. Then she said, the second thing I want you to promise me is that you'll always do the right thing, even when the right thing is the hard thing. And I thought about that, and I said, yes, Mama, I'll do that. And finally she said, the third thing I want you to promise is that you'll never drink alcohol. Well, I was nine years old, and so I said, yes, Mama, I'll do that. And he points out that he is grandfather and several of his older uncles uh, had issues with alcoholism and that was a painful thing for his grandma and so he made the promise. During the TED talk, 52 year old Brian Stevenson owned up to the fact that he had never tasted alcohol. And he makes the case not because of his virtuosity, not because of, of you know, to, to to earn the approval of the audience, for, for sure, but to point out how important this moment was for his sense of identity. This talk with his grandma helped to form who he was as a person. It formed who he became. He became a, a man who did great things in the name of justice, the Equal Justice Initiative. There were dozens of people that he dug into their cases and discovered that they were wrongfully charged or wrongfully sentenced or unfairly sentenced. And he was able to bring justice to the lives of many, many people, uh, focusing in the South and in, in the states of the South. He argued before the Supreme Court and won a number of decisions there. This guy has done great things. In part, not, not in small part, I would say, he would say, because his grandma saw something in him and called it out. Well, his story goes on. He was 14 or 50. His brother, his older brother and sister were there after school. Somewhere his brother got, uh, got a six-pack of beer, and they went out into the woods, and, and his brother took, took a few swigs of the beer and uh, handed it to his sister. His sister took a little bit of the beer, and... Then they turned to Brian and said, here, have some. And Brian says, no, 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 that's okay. You all, you all go ahead. I'm not going to have any beer. Well, his brother said, come on, we're doing this. You always do what we do. I had some. Your sister had some. Have some beer. And, and Brian, again, I'm reading his words. I said, no, no, I don't feel right about that. You all go ahead. You all go ahead. And then my brother started staring at me. What's wrong with you? Have some beer. And he looked at me real hard and said, Oh, I hope you're not still hung up on that conversation Mama had with you. Well, you know, she told all of us grandkids that we were special. 
Isn't that true? That all of us are special. That same meaning didn't take root in that older si- those older siblings' hearts. They were, they were trying to be her. But they all knew and heard from their mama that they were special. These parables that Jesus tells, the parable of the seed, the, the kingdom of heaven is like a seed. It starts out so tiny, and yet it becomes large enough for the birds to nest in. Take that parable into the woods with you and check out an acorn and look at a huge oak tree that's come from an acorn just like the one that you are holding in your palm of your hand. And think about life. Think about life. Think about how God has ordained seeds to provide for life, to provide the nourishment of life, to provide for the needs of the birds, the needs of the squirrels, for our needs and the seed of wheat, a grain of wheat or a grain of corn. In that little genetic miracle, is all that we need for life. With some water, with some soil, good soil, all that we need to live. The kingdom of heaven starts small and it grows and it becomes something large. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast. When mixed in the flour, a little bit of yeast leavens the whole bunch. Or it's like a treasure that's hidden in a field. It's something that's so very precious that someone would go and sell all that they had so that they could obtain the field, that they could obtain this kingdom, this this relationship with God. Or the kingdom is like the merchant in search of fine pearls. Whenever he finds the one of great value, again, he is willing to do anything to to obtain it, to buy or to have that pearl. Or the net that pulls in fish of all kinds that are one day separated into what's useful and what's not useful. The kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven draws us It draws us in. It creates in us this passion, this yearning that, as these two of these parables say, it's like everything else pales in comparison to the value, to the yearning for this kingdom. Like the song, Come All Who Thirst, like the thirsty one who's in the desert who finds the the oasis, there's a yearning makes all the other yearnings pale in comparison. The finder sells everything, gives everything else up in order to be a part of this kingdom. I believe, brothers and sisters, that that's a yearning that is deep in the hearts of all people. That this kingdom is, is like a driving force. It's a driving force yearning that draws each of us toward a greater good, toward a new way of living, toward a new way of connecting with God, but also a new way of connecting with the people around us. And again, you look at the whole Gospel of Matthew and how the metaphors he uses for what this means to live in this kingdom. And again, I come back to this commission, this com- commandment, excuse me, to love God. Back to Deuteronomy 6, to love God with all that we are and to love others as ourselves. That yearning is planted in the hearts of all creation, all people. There's a deep yearning for our identity or our purpose that's special and unique in this kingdom.
Oh, that this attraction, oh, that God would grow this attraction in the hearts of all people. Oh, that this attraction would grow in the hearts of people who are, are, are filled with strife or division or, or angst. Oh, that this attraction for a kinder and more gentle way of living life, of living in love and justice and peace, would take root in the heart of people. I wonder how this yearning has been part of our experiences as, as the congregation here, but as, as people. What are the moments, like Brian's moment with his grandma, his mom, that helped you to become part of the church? What are those moments that helped you become who you are? As I began to think about that this week, there, there were a lot of things I could mention, but the one that stands out were my summers at, at Camp Sotara. The summers of 1982 and 83. Oh my goodness, that was a long time ago. One of those weeks, one of the very first weeks, I was a camp counselor the summer of 1982. The camp was a small camp. It was like third and fourth graders, junior, juniors, I think we called them. And the camp was done by whole host of volunteers from the Elizabethtown Church of the Brethren. And I just finished as a freshman at E-Town, but I really hadn't gone to the E-Town Church much yet, so I didn't know very many of the folks who came to be counselors and directors and all. And at our meeting that first week, um, the Somers, and I forget their name, and I don't know that they might be related to our, to our family, our family here at Everett, but I think her name was Lana, and I, I'm sorry I can't remember his name. They were the directors, and they sat down with the all the people, there were only two or three staff counselors in the group that week. Most were volunteers from Ethan. And they began to go over the list of chores for the week and, and ask for volunteers. And one of the first things was vesters. Who would like to lead a vesters service? Now, this is one of my first weeks at camp. This is, I'm green and, and naive, and I don't even know how hard this is or what I'm getting myself into, but my hand goes up. And I agreed to do a vesper service. And I had a couple of these little books around children's stories. I decided we were going to do vespers out on Vesper Hill, which is like a 10-minute walk from where we were at the West area. And we walked out and we did this vesper. I don't remember anything about that. But I remember at the end of the week, whenever we got our evaluation done, these decembers couldn't get over how the fact that I was the only one in the whole group of volunteers to put my hand up and say, I'll do a Vesper service. They made such a deal about that, and for me it was nothing. But the week, and, and as I spent those summers at camp, as the evaluations piled up, I began to see that in the relationship of camp, as a counselor and in relationship with the other, other counselors and with the kids, people began to see something in me that I did not see in myself at all. And that was that I was a, a, a leader. I couldn't see that. But I heard it over and over again. The second summer, now you got to picture me. If you search, you can find some pictures of me from those summer camps. I had all this hair. I had a beard, you know, for like 17 years, and that beard became a part of my identity. So, the second summer, this one kid from Air, Eric from uh, Pulaski, southwestern Virginia, he was tall, you know, and he was kidding me all the time about being so short, and he started to, started to call me Papa Smurf, you know, and it became a, a term of endearment, and, and it became a part of my identity in that circle. Like, you know, the, it, it was just kind of a strange forming experience for me. One thing that comes to me this week as I'm pondering all of this is everyone, everyone needs to hear from their brothers and sisters in the church, from their Sunday school teacher, or from their pastors, or from people who are part of the body of Christ. We all need to hear that we are special. We all need to hear that we are loved, and we all need to know that, that God is this ever-present Father whose arms are always open to receive us, 
like that prodigal who made his way home, to be welcomed and to be restored and to be whispered to, you are special, you are my child, and I love you. We, brothers and sisters, are the voice of God to one another. We all need to be sharing with one another those special, we need to be looking at each other, like mom. We need to be looking at each other's lives, and we need to be willing to be the voice of that spirit, the spirit of the Father of God, telling one another again and again, you are special, you are loved, you are able, you can do great things. We especially need to be that voice for our young people, for our children, for our youth, who aren't always hearing that. We need to know they are loved, they are special, they are able. You are, I need to say, you are special in God's heart. The invitation this morning is that I, I hope that we can all pray. Pray for this yearning, this kingdom to be, this yearning to grow in the hearts of all people. We need to hear the Spirit whispering to us, you are special, you can do great things. And finally, we need to take on this identity. We need to allow that identity to shape us, to allow that identity in the kingdom of God to supersede all the other things that might have formed us, all the other voices we've heard. That voice of God, you are special, needs to stand out in our minds, in our hearts, and it needs to become who we are. It needs to shape how we relate to others. It needs to shape our, our words. It needs to shape our priorities. It needs to shape our yearnings. Imagine, imagine a world where everyone knows that they're loved where everyone knows that they're special, where everyone knows that, that nothing is impossible, where everyone is focused on what is good, what is just, what is loving and kind. Just imagine how different our world would be right now if we could be changed into this identity Jesus had for all people, that Jesus intended for all people, loving God, loving each other, building one another up in love, instead of criticizing or tearing down or dividing or, or condemning. Hear the Spirit whispering, you're special, you can do great things. Feel the embrace, feel the welcome, feel the yearning, the yearning that the merchant had for the pearl, the yearning that the, the, the one had for the, for the treasure, the yearning for the kingdom. And to take on the identity, you are a child of God. I invite you to pray with me. Oh God, help us feel the embrace. Help us to feel your presence, your acceptance and love and mercy. Help us to hear your whisper, you are special. I've created you and I've called you by name and you belong to me. You can do great things. Help us, O oh Lord, your people, be the East, with that message and with that love in our hearts. Help us to go out into a world where we, we are concerned about, about connecting. We're concerned about hugging one another. We're, we're concerned about illness. But help us, oh God, find ways to welcome people in. To welcome people in to the identity that you created for them. 
the identity you created them to be. Will God inspire us, empower us, and fill us with your life? In Jesus' name. Yes, I would like you to hear um, just a postlude, and after we play, we'll hear the blessing after the music. <laughs> justice and truth. May we go into this world renewed and filled and empowered to make a difference for Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen.